Welcome to this QZIT seminar. It's a great pleasure to have Tobias Kippenberg as a speaker today. And uh, Tobias will talk about photonic chip scale frequency combs. Tobias, it's all yours. Okay, so uh, first of all, um, thank you, Klaus, and uh, uh, QZIT for inviting me, for giving this uh, presentation. And uh, I should say upfront, I've um, been really um, uh, very pleased and, and of course it's been very instrumental to have the support of QSIT, not just financially, but also in terms of community. Um, and I want to extend my warm uh, uh, appreciation really for you, Klaus, for, for leading this, this QSIT over the last years. And it's really set off uh, what I think is a yeah, large quantum revolution in Switzerland that hopefully will continue. Um, so um, I would like to tell you um, uh, today about work we're doing in the group, my group, and um, my primary um, talk about today will be about photonic chip scale frequency combs, but I would like to give you at the beginning a bit of an overview of what kind of motivates um, not just my group, but really the field. Um, um, uh, and that is the field of um, low dissipation systems and, and integrated non photonics. Now, before starting, I also mentioned there's a lot of very talented co-workers that have been uh, instrumental in this work. Also, many of the work and results I'm showing is not that the results done by an individual lab, it's close collaborations with Michael Gordetsky, John Bauer, Sino Bava, Christian Kuz, Tobias Hare, and Paul Seidler. Um, so I want to mention these, these groups up front. So um, what I'd like to start with um, is, um, is to give you a kind of um, um, perspective on nonlinear photonics. So a lot of the things I'm going to talk about today is nonlinear optics. And nonlinear optics is admittedly a very old field. Already back in the, in the 70s and 80s, the foundations were laid, it was understood um, um, how light at high intensities interacts nonlinearly with materials, giving rise to Bruin scattering, Raman scattering, many other nonlinearities, such as parametric nonlinearities, which we'll talk about. Um, and, um, and these nonlinearities have really laid the foundation um, to very important um, experiments that are both very fundamental in nature, but also uh, are leading to applications. And I want to give just three applications and examples of nonlinear optics. Today, um, you can generate entangled photon pairs. The driving kind of driving interaction that allows to do that is parametric down conversion. And evidently in Switzerland, um, we know that interaction very well. Um, uh, Edie Quantique, um, a kind of a pioneer in quantum cryptography, uses uh, um, single photons, uh, which can, for instance, be generated using this down conversion process. Now, non optics is also important uh, to generate squeezed states of light. And what started as a scientific curiosity maybe uh, three decades ago is now really technology. Squeezed light will be in implemented uh, in advanced LIGO and will help actually to detect more frequently the mergers of black holes or neutron stars. Um, and it's uh, becoming a, a workhorse really of, of quantum metrology and driving fundamental physics experiments. Now, in the third wave of developments, and that's more recently, um, the very strong interaction of light and nonlinear materials have really given rise to a uh, revolution in our ability to measure optical frequencies. And that has been instrumental to unlock optical frequency combs, which I'll we'll talk about today. What you see here in the background is a process called supercontinuum generation. It's been really pioneered by Philip Russell um, that shows the dramatic coherent broadening of light um, in, in optical fibers. Now, against this background, um, it's really, um, even though we may not perceive it, but really nonlinear optics is, is a constant kind of workhorse in quantum science, but also metrology or, or precision measurements. Now, um, what's happened over the last 10 years is I think a very, very exciting new frontier that, that uh, uh, my lab is part of and many other labs have joined. And that is to go to a field of nonlinear integrated photonics where what initially um, was studied in, in tabletop experiments with optical fibers, OPO bulk crystals, due to advances in, in micro nanofabrication and also advances on materials can now take place on chip. Um, and so today it's possible to generate OPOs, to generate optical frequency combs, supercontinuum, and many other phenomena directly on chip by making advances and making use of light confinement in typically optical resonators to enhance the intensity. And so processes that typically took kind of very intense laser fields like nanojoule pulse energy now you know, take place a picojoule energy, even continuous wave, and now to kind of access uh, both no nonlinear phenomena, but also new nonlinear phenomena. And so against this background, um, let me mention that really one of the, uh, the key techniques that many in the field use um, is a technique of light enhancement via micro cavities. And here I'd like to um, pause for a moment and really um, make a tribute to the um, very important foundational work, uh, Michael Gordetsky, who unfortunately deceased um, um, uh, a few years ago, 
uh, in a very untimely manner um, made. And Michael Gorelsky and Braginsky already in the late 80s um, discovered by serendipity that if you melt a piece of glass, then you can obtain very long photon storage time in dielectric resonators. And already at the time, they were kind of dreaming of using this for kind of single photon on the optics. And what I've shown here on the right hand side, actually is a lab book of Michael Gorelsky, kind of sketching out how to make kind of these whispering gallery type of resonators. Now today, um, 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 these resonators are, are, are used in many kind of research fields. And I would like to highlight two of them. And for this, I've show here this historical slide back with, with work I did with Kerry Bahala many years ago, almost two decades, but shows the kind of the physics you could access in these resonators. So despite being very simple and very simplistic, it's just dielectric um, with low losses. It turns out uh, they naturally allow you to achieve two nonlinearities. The first is the interaction of light and mechanical motion. And that was actually a kind of a, 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 what's, what's now textbook knowledge at the time was kind of contentious. Um, can radiation pressure also act in microscopic objects? And yes, it can, um, provided you um, are confined to light in, 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 in objects um, that are microscopic, where there's a large interaction of light and matter via radiation pressure. And this gives rise to this very well known radiation pressure Hamiltonian that couples A to A, the photon number, to the mechanical oscillator coordinate. And this G naught is the vacuum coupling rate. So it tells you how much frequency shift. Okay, uh, at the vacuum fluctuations cost. And in these resonators, it's quite surprising that vacuum coupling rate can be very sizable. So, you know, a few tens of kilohertz, even to megahertz. Now, the other interaction, uh, and that's really what I want to talk about today, is the Karen linearity. And the Karen linearity is the elemental correction to the uh, linear relationship between polarization and electric fields in a media. And it comes, uh, typically has many contributions, but one contribution comes from the electronic nonlinearity. So any material that has uh, an inversion symmetry, so amorphous media. Um, the first order correction is third order, which gives rise to a four photon interaction. So the Hamiltonian takes on the form of annihilating two photons, A to A, uh, sorry, A, A, and then creating new, two new photons. And the key is that this process can take, can give rise to optical frequency combs because it annihilates modes in different modes. Okay, so one can annihilate modes in, 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 in different transfers or longitudinal modes of the resonator and generate two new photon pairs. Now this interaction is typically very, very weak. And so what's really important is to have high intensities and small volume to actually make that interaction strong. And so these are just two applications that kind of were unlocked in these, uh, in these optical microresonators. And today it's a, it's, a, it's a very, very large field. And, one, uh, and there's even the possibility of making these integrated resonators really CMOS compatible with a whole wide range of materials that ranges from compound semiconductors uh, all the way to low loss dielectrics. And, uh, and also it's moving now very quickly from, from a kind of benchtop research into real applications. And I'll explain kind of where, where we stand on that. So, um, so I lab is general interest in these two areas. So broadly speaking, we are investigating the, the what I call light on chip, so light confinement and, and views of uh, studying kind of quantum optomechanics, interaction of light and mechanical motion um, uh, and observing quantum phenomena of radiation pressure um, and on the other hand, we have a very applied side that is really looking at, at moving this integrated photonics into, into applications. Um, so um, also, um, I would, should say this is, um, it would be myopic to, 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 to stop here. I mean, there's many more applications of, uh, of, of light confinement, optic resonators um, uh, in the world. Let me just then mention two that we also actually work on in my group. The one is replacing materials with third order nonlinearity by second order nonlinearity. And you can then study what is called cavity electro optics. In this case, um, you have the same optomechanical Hamiltonian, except that you replace the mechanical oscillator with a microwave mode. And this has been recognized uh, already uh, a decade ago by, by Mankai Tsang. And it's really now in the last four or five years that a lot of advances are being made in realizing cavity electro optical systems, which allow you to cool, amplify, and also read out microwave fields uh, uh, using, kind of using, using photons. And uh, another interesting new direction um, is, is, is really, um, uh, um, really inspired by, by pioneering work of Klaus Ropers on, on modifying electron wave functions with optics. And just recently, we have a very beautiful collaboration which has shown that integrated photonics can be used to actually shape the wave function of electrons. And also here, the resonators actually provide the vehicle to increase the light matter interaction um, to achieve even continuous um, uh, wave modulation of, of electron beams. Now, um, um, since I will not talk about it, let me still mention kind of some of the advances that my, my group is making, um, uh, um, really on making very low loss kind of uh, mechanical oscillators coupled to optical cavities for, for optomechanics. 
And, uh, and so this is just one example of uh, work that we're doing in the group where we're studying the light matter interaction in strained silicon nitride resonators. And here, uh, my group in particular, uh, Niels Engelson um, and Missione Fellow, um, uh, demonstrated remarkably large quality factors now as large as 13 billion, so exceeding 10 to the 10 in strained silicon resonators, which really uh, puts these uh, devices now on par with kind of the decoherence rate of trapped ions. And so generally we're interested in, in looking at radiation pressure quantum phenomena, such as radi radiation pressure quantum back action, and just exploring the fundamental limits of dissipation in these systems. And, um, and uh, we also have activities on optical mechanics, looking, uh, not coupling it to optical cavities, but to microwave cavities, such as LC circuits. And there, uh, most recently in my group, we have been looking, and again, I will not cover this, but want to share this slide, looking at making kind of topological systems, so couples, optical mechanical systems in a multi-mode regime, where each of these devices here are LC circuits with a vacuum gap capacitor coupled. Um, and we can explore, for instance, the very simple SSH model, like a very simple topological model, but now add one more degree of freedom, which actually are localized phonons on each side. And, and so this is to just one kind of flavor of also work we're, we're, we're investigating in the group. It will not be a subject of the talk today because the talk today, really what I'd like to talk about is, is something that um, uh, is, is optical frequency metrology. And so, um, so, my one sentence slide to optical uh, frequency combs, which I think many of you know, is that um, optical combs um, have uh, been a truly um, yeah, revolutionary uh, idea of Ted Hansch and Jen Hall that um, has really um, uh, increased the ability of, of human mankind to measure frequencies in almost remarkable kind of, kind of level. And so with optical frequency combs, one can now measure kind of uh, the optical frequency to the 18th decimal digit and the way this functions is by using a very simple idea, and that is the idea of a mode lock laser that is broad in a nonlinear fiber to an octave coherently, again, using nonlinear uh, uh, processes. And, um, and one stabilizes the envelope frequency, a technique actually that, that Ursula Keller uh, at the same time with Ted Hunch both came up with. And that's really unlocked frequency metrology and, and, and it gave rise to the ability to link phase coherently the optical domain, which oscillates with hundreds of terahertz with the microwave domain. Um, so optical clocks or optical, yeah, are an, one example that can be realized in an optical clock. What one does is uh, one uses the comb to link an optical frequency to the RF. But we can also go the other way around, uh, synthesize an optical frequency from a radio frequency um, and, and thereby use the optical comb as a synthesizer. So the, the, clock, the, the, the clock work here is the optical frequency comb. Now, what's um, uh, interesting about optical frequency combs is that there's many more applications than just clocks or synthesizers. And, and I'll give some example actually in this, in this talk today. Now, um, optical clocks are commercial technology. Um, um, uh, there's a number of companies, uh, uh, really the pioneer here is Mendel Systems, a spin out from, from Ted Hensch and John Holtzwart, and they've commercialized laser optical frequency combs. And today there are about 300 combs in, in different laboratories worldwide. And we're um, kind of privileged also to have one of our Mendel Systems in our lab uh, that we use for, for all kinds of calibration measurements uh, of um, uh, in, our, in our dispersion measurements. Now, what has happened over the last uh, kind of 15 years, however, is that there's really a, a, a um, uh, now a possibility to bring optical frequency combs um, and truly make them ubiquitous. And that vision was first formulated in this image here I show from DARPA. So it was a DARPA program that started about a decade ago um, to bring this vision um, of having a RF to optical link on a chip. And, and what is, would be the advantage of just, of just and, and the first type you might say, okay, just miniaturization um, may, um, um, but the fact that miniaturization is really key to many applications that we enjoy in our daily lives. So it's the ability to make systems that can be mass manufacturable, that are wafer scale, that are integrable, um, that makes a technology become widely deployed. And even today, um, uh, Optical frequency combs are only used in specialized laboratories, even though their use is going far beyond. And um, uh, what many groups, including ours, are working on is to lay the foundation to make that transition right now of combs to become really a widely used technology. And so what I'd like to share with you today is actually what, go, what kind of physics goes into making a chip scale frequency comb and kind of what novel applications beyond the ones of, of frequency metrology can be, can be accessed. And so the physics that we use to generate chip scale frequency combs differs from mode lock lasers uh, in some uh, very fundamental ways. What we are using to generate optical combs are parametric oscillations. And so what are parametric oscillations? 
uh, again, it's a four photon process. Whenever you pump a cavity, so imagine you have many cavity modes that are equidistantly spaced here, and you pump these, then what you will see is that above, above a certain threshold, okay, you have regenerative oscillations of sidebands. Um, so what happens here is that you have, again, the parametric oscillations, you have parametric fluorescence. Um, so you generate signal idle photon pairs. Um, and due to energy conservation, these must be equidistant. Um, and um, now one comment about this process, uh, in contrast to conventional laser, this process scales with inverse Q squared. So that means that if you have a high Q cavity, you can dramatically reduce the threshold, okay, for this process. And so, for example, um, in typical optic micro resonance here, we can drive that process down to power levels of just a few microwatt uh, for these parametric oscillations. Now, um, um, these parametric oscillations actually are very similar um, to the processes that are also studied in superconducting circuits. So there um, you have a Johnson junction. Johnson junction has a nonlinearity. And if you linearize it, the first correction to your cosine potential is a, also a quartic Hamiltonian. Um, and the process we're using is also um, termed in this community bifurcation. Okay? So it's in fact, the cavity bifurcates, becomes unstable and generates sidebands. And so just a historical remark, um, this process was called bifurcation amplifier in the Johnson uh, junction community. Uh, it's called parametric oscillations um, and parametric amplification in the, in the optics community. But again, the Hamiltonian is, is, is exactly the same. So this process gives rise to sidebands. Again, um, uh, what's really happening on the fundamental level here is that uh, if you look at your intracavity uh, power in the cavity, typically it's wrenching at low power, but at high power, because there's the kernel in the air that shifts the cavity in an intensity dependent manner, the cavity um, uh, buildup factor, okay, starts to be starts to tilt, okay, and you have a region where the cavity becomes bistable. And I'll talk about that bistable region a bit later. But um, the moment the cavity becomes bistable, okay, it bifurcates and causes these parametric sidebands to appear. So the power threshold required for this process is just shifting the cavity by by the line width. So this process gives rise to optical combs. Uh, optical frequency combs have been observed in virtually every platform, uh, be it, uh, be it uh, initially glasses to magnesium fluoride, calcium fluoride. Um, more recently, also more exotic materials were, were added such as diamonds uh, um, and also a very important class of materials such as 3,5 uh, compounds, aluminum, gallium arsenide, gallium phosphide, and even materials with Chi2 like uh, lithium nitrate. And so all these systems kind of exhibit um, uh, these parametric oscillations and, and optical comb formation um, and some materials even at exceptionally low thresholds. Now, uh, nevertheless, there's, there are challenges associated with that process and, uh, and, uh, and the bifurcation I just explained um, um, can cascade and generate a comb, but in reality, the system is a lot more complex. And, and, and what really happens is that uh, in optical resonators where kappa, the cavity decay rate is, is, is large, okay, and where the dispersion okay, is small, which is virtually true for every integrated photonic platform, because there typically the losses are, are high, much higher than dispersion. Um, that system tends to not only generate combs in a coherent manner, but in a chaotic manner. And, and this can be very easily understood by understanding that the parametric oscillations that take place have many pathways. So you can, they don't have to take place on adjacent cavity resonances, but one can obtain primary combs that scatter photons very far away, that then be a non-degenerate fork mixing fill in and generate a chaotic waveform. And, uh, and so to show you kind of um, uh, um, how such a waveform looks like, let me give you one example. So this is a high resolution um, uh, comb based calibration method that allows you to measure every optical frequency generated in the, in the micro resonator. And what's shown here in gray is just one cavity resonance. And if you look into one cavity resonance, what you see is you see a multiplet of lines, okay, that are all generated via different forest mixing pathways. So there are much more cavity lines or, or optical fields generated than there are cavity modes. And it's a very chaotic system. And so how can you generate a coherent optical frequency chrome from, from such incoherent mixture of, of light? And what's really remarkable is that nature has a process, okay, that forces these systems to become fully coherent. And that's the formation of solitons. And so these solitons uh, uh, were discovered by Tobias Herr, my group, who's now in Hamburg leading a research group. And, and, and what he observed is that if you pump such a crystal resonator, um, then um, what you see is there's a region where the system becomes chaotic. So you, you, pump, you pump light, you drop light into resonator, transmission reduces. You look at the repetition rate beat node, you see a lot of noise coming from all these sidebands and suddenly the system stabilizes. And it stabilizes exactly in the region the cavity bifurcates. So where the, this, this character-tilted profile has both the upper uh, branch solution and lower branch solution. And what's very surprising, you see a series of discrete steps. 
And so initially, it was a lot of, uh, um, uh, yeah, we now understand what these steps are. These steps are um, the transition from a different number of solitons. So we see here five, four, three, two, and then to, all the way to one soliton. So what's really happening here is that this system uh, um, is uh, in frequency domain described by forward mixing, but we can also um, adopt a time domain um, a representation. And this was, um, is now very well understood. Um, and um, so the forward mixing equations that um, have a pump, a cavity decay rate, and, uh, and the forward mixing terms can be recasted from frequency domain where mu is a mode um, into time domain where A is an amplitude of the field inside the resonator. And in this case, the mean field equation is a equation that has a dispersion term, okay, uh, that comes from the cavity from the group loss of dispersion. There is a nonlinear term that comes from the forward mixing. But then on the right-hand side, there's new terms. There is a detuning term, a loss term, and then a pumping term. So the left-hand side of this equation, um, uh, that's actually very well known that th these are the solutions that part of the equation are just uh, solitons. The right-hand part, that's a deviation because there's a loss. And so what these um, solitons are, they are solutions to a driven dissipative and nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So in some sense, they are solitons of an open system, open meaning that the system is continuously losing energy to the environment. And, um, and so, um, so these solitons and open systems um, are really an example of a much wider class of phenomena in nature. And I want to um, pause here and, and give you a bit wider perspective. And so it was already recognized in the, in the 70s, uh, very early by the, in particular the pioneering work of uh, Ilya Prigozhin, that if you have a system that is nonlinear and it's out of equilibrium, which in particular is a setting you encounter in chemistry, then you have pattern formation. And so these are called Turing patterns, uh, morphogenesis. And what, um, and this is just an example of stripe formation in, 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 in chemical systems. And what effectively we're observing here is exactly the same. We have a system that is nonlinear, it's driven, it's dissipative, it's driven out of equilibrium. And what it causes is the formation, the self stabilization of pattern formation. And the equation that describes this is called the Gartner Lefebvre equation. And Lugato was the first to kind of take those ideas from, from chemistry and move it into the domain of optics or in the late 80s. So that LE is a perfect description of the system we have. And if you take a look at the Lefebvre equation, you can look for solutions. And um, uh, we have a detuning of the laser, we have a pump power, and those form a kind of two-dimensional kind of state space. And we can solve our phase diagram and we find unstable states, we find uh, stable solitons and also breather solitons, the solitons whose amplitude changes with, kind of, with time. And so um, in order to access solitons, um, what one has to do is one has to transition through that region of instability first, where the cavity bifurcates, and then enter regions simply by changing the laser detuning where one can access solitons. Now, this chart I've shown here actually is, is vastly simplified. So in reality, we now understand there's much more phases present. The system has, uh, has uh, spatial temporal chaos. It had voids. It had breather solitons occurring in unusual regimes. One can even form soliton crystals. So there's a lot comp more complex as shown here, uh, in particular when one adds corrections to this LE equation. So, um, um, so this is how solitons are generated. We pump the resonator. We initially generate coherent sidebands then they become uh, instable. We, we, so these are coherent sidebands and these coherent solitons, or in this case, my patterns they're called, but they also have solitonic character. Um, these collide and then give rise to stable solitons. Um, and, uh, and that's the states that we are really interested in. Now, um, a couple of um, comments about solitons. What, what makes these solitons in, in resonators interesting and, and, and different than say mode block lasers? And uh, primarily um, we can generate very high repetition rates uh, all the way up to terahertz, uh, all the way down to tens of gigahertz, which are challenging to attain in conventional mode block lasers. Um, the pulses can be very short. Uh, shortest pulses are just single cycles, few cycles. Um, they have smooth spectral envelopes we can predict and also their envelope is, uh, is, is, is tunable. So by the, the tuning of the laser, we can actually change the duration of the soliton. Now, um, uh, a couple of aspects that are remarkable of the solitons is that it's an incredibly stable attractor. So you might intuitively think, well, solitons are this very idealized system. You need to have an optical fiber that's perfect, very low loss, and then you can observe it. And actually that's not true. So um, these dissipative solitons um, are incredibly robust to disorder. So any resonator, without going into detail, let me just mention an example here. This is a crystal resonator that's polished. And instead of having just one mode family, it has many. And these mode families, they cross, they interact, they give rise to perturbations. But a soliton still finds way to exist. Whenever there's a perturbation, it emits dispersive waves to stabilize the waveform. 
And, um, and this even raises the very philosophical question, kind of what dispersion do we even need to generate sultans? It looks like sultans form no matter what. And it's indeed true that even in a normal dispersion regime with very exotic dispersion profile, you can form switching waves. And, and this is something that the field has, has, has really understood over the last, last years. So another example of giving um, um, of how intuitive and also um, um, and also to to link back to this idea of bifurcation, this is again the cavity resonance uh, for a um, if you scan across a laser resonance if you have a kernel linearity it becomes bistable and the sultan really lives on both branches so a portion of the pump field actually is on the upper branch a portion on the lower branch and this you can even probe so if you do a modulation response you see the cavity resonance and another resonance okay a hump here and this one is the response of the sultan once is the response of the, of, the, of, the, of the lower branch. And one is detuned further from the cavity of the other. The sultan is very close to the cavity resonance, whereas the, uh, the lower branch is further detuned. And uh, in fact, the, the kernel linearity can, can be very large in these systems. So you can have um, uh, detunings, okay, where the cavity and the sultan are detuned by more than 50 cavity line width. So this, this, this shows a very intuitive situation where the pump laser is very, very far from the resonance, but still the system supports the formation of sartan and also explains why it's a contrast between the pump laser and the sartan. Now these this bit of sartans um, um, have a lot of intriguing dynamics and we have been, uh, um, we and also many colleagues in the field have been studying them. They can give rise to crystals. Um, you can generate even multiple sartans with different repetition rates in the same resonator. They interact with the Raman on the ART. Um, you can observe breather sartans. They switch and also have very um, surprising nonlinear filtering dynamics. And so over the last years, there's been a lot of work in the field on, uh, um, uh, of understanding the dynamics of these sartans. And with kind of each observation that was made, another correction was done. And this is personally something I enjoyed a lot about the research that in a sense that in many cases, we go to the lab, we observe a phenomena, we don't know what it is. We go back to the theory, we try to add a term to our Hamiltonian and see uh, um, uh, how, how it corrects for it. And so it's really an example where we're experiments really driving kind of the theory uh, uh, that, that follows suits, and that, that's that's been that's been very uh, very pleasing and charming. Now these sultans have also been observed in many platforms, a bit less than than care uh, but still they've been observed in, in in platforms ranging from crystals to uh, also integrated platforms such as silicon lithium iodate or silicon nitride. And it's really particular this observation of these uh, sultans in, in in integrated platforms that has um, given a lot of impetus to the field because that really allows to manufacturers devices in a, in a scalable way to include and in, in, in integrate them with on-chip pump lasers or even other functionalities such as splitters, modulators, and really make them, make them deployable in, in, in system level applications. And so the platform that, um, that we have uh, worked um, particularly on is, uh, is uh, a platform called silicon nitride. And so silicon nitride actually is a material that's very well known in the semiconductor industry. It's used as an end cap layer and an edge stop layer or stressor layer for transistors. Um, and it has a couple of very useful properties when it comes to optics. And uh, chief among them is the fact that its transparency window ranges from the visible to the mid IR. It has a band gap of five electron volts in contrast to silicon, uh, which means that it has no true photon absorption. And also it's a space compatible material. And it's a material already compatible with semiconductor manufacturing. But there's a couple of challenges on the material, which in particular is the, is the high stress. Uh, and I'll come back to that point uh, back in a second. So um, uh, in order to make combs, um, you have to dispersion engineer. And the way we do that is we make thick films of silicon nitride. Thick in this case means typically wavelength scale. Um, a weakly confining waveguide has a uh, group velocity dispersion that's normal. A tightly confining waveguide such as this one has an anomalous group velocity dispersion and therefore will support the formation of dissipative carosolitons. That's also what we observed um, uh, in contrast to uh, um, materials with low linearity. The silicon nitride has um, one. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Just a quick interruption. Andreas yes. Walraff has a question. Oh, yeah, so, sure. Andreas, go ahead. Okay, okay. so no. do you hear me now? Yeah, okay. Good. No, yes. Klaus unmuted me. Um, I was curious. Uh, for what sets the limit of the density of the solitons in, in, in this resonator? So how, how many can you have simultaneously? Um, and, and what's the length scale that, that determines that? Uh, I'm, I'm just curious. So they're similar, like in these nonlinear superconducting uh, resonators, for example, in these uh, ring Josephson junction resonators that I, I worked on a long time ago at, at, at my PhD. Or so you can also make the, in this sign, you can make these sign Gordon solitons. Exactly. And, mm -hmm. 
and they have a certain length scale. Uh, and that sets sort of a limit of the number that you could have in, in, a, in a ring of a, of a given geometry. And then also the attainable sort of frequency discretization mm -hmm. from, the, from the motion of the solitons along this resonator. And so I, I, I was curious what- uh, In our case, it was, it's a very good question. And in fact, thank you for pointing this out, actually. As I allude to, the, 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 there's a lot of beautiful work actually done in the supernatural community, um, where they also observe the same kind of discrete steps and form kind of solitons. Uh, in our system, we're we simply limited. So the, the typical number of solitons we generate initially is just determined by the primary site that we generate, because that gives a modulation uh, and sets a background potential. And then this, on this background potential, actually solitons actually, actually lock onto it. They're kind of trapped, like an optical trapping. Um, and so in theory, if you uh, were to make a dispersion profile that's very flat and you, can, and you move these, the first primary sidepins very far out, you can get very, very densely spaced kind of solitons. Um, and, uh, and that's indeed also what we observe. We can even generate what these soliton crystals and then the crystalline lattice space is determined simply by the primary sidebands. Um, and uh, so, that, so it, um, to give an example, the largest number we have seen uh, in, in, in resonators where it was almost close to a hundred perfectly spaced uh, kind of solitons. Uh, and this, the, the pulse duration there uh, can be very short as alluded to the shortest pulse duration we've seen in our lab is about you know four four to five optical cycles so uh, below 25 femtoseconds but yeah it's but it's very um, interesting to to point out yeah also these analogies that's why also i mentioned this, this work on the params which is very very similar uh, except that here we have a much more uh, higher mode density of course than in, than, than in single junctions a couple of the lcs um so coming back to the uh, silicon nitride one of the kind of um um, surprising aspect is that the system is so nonlinear that the solitons become so broad that uh, the dispersion can also flip sign and uh, simply by the naturally varying dispersion, silicon nitride. And that gives rise to so called strength of radiation, where the soliton has a, a tail that it generates and that gives a boost in the power of the soliton in the, in, in this, in the speckle end, which actually is very useful for self referencing. And so this um, effect has been already long predicted, also observed in supercontinuum. In fact, this dispersive wave formation is actually the driving process uh, of supercontinuum generation. And we also observed this in our silicon nitride devices, um, uh, where it allows us to generate uh, yeah, spectra almost two thirds of an octave in silicon nitride. Um, and to properly describe these, we have to now add to the Dugato Lefebvre equation, the Raman long ART, and also higher order dispersion terms. And um, what I'd like to share with this slide is that we have a very, very good understanding actually of the, uh, of the speckle envelope, um, which can be predicted with very high accuracy um, uh, um, uh, in, the, in these systems. Now, um, the expersion profile determines the salt information. Um, so for instance, you can generate um, with a dispersion with two zero dispersion points, you can generate two dispersive waves. Um, um, this is particularly useful for self-referencing uh, where you want to double the red end of the comb and superimpose it with the blue end. Um, one can even form solitons or so-called switching waves in the normal dispersion regime. Um, and uh, also one can observe solitons that are locked to other entities such as Raman solitons. So it's a very, very interesting kind of uh, interplay of, of nonlinearity and dispersion that gives rise to a whole host of phenomena, not just bright solitons, but also switching waves or Raman self-locked solitons. Now, uh, to give one example, it's even, um, and uh, only one slide, maybe um, for the experts here, um, um, I'm mostly gonna talk about dissipative cell tons with have animals group velocity dispersion. We've also understood that they are switching waves which are appearing in a normal dispersion, but actually what's really interesting, you have even dispersions in it, even cell tons in the absence of dispersion, which are very non-intuitive. So even with vanishing group velocity dispersion, you can still form coherent waveforms that are just stabilized by higher order dispersion. And so we've recently discovered them by serendipity and, and this really shows that these coherent waveforms form across the entire dispersion landscape from normal to animalis to vanishing. Now, what can you do with these uh, Santa microcombs? And, and we have been, um, um, and many other colleagues in the field studying different applications. And um, I want to emphasize here just a few um, that kind of show the utility. And so first of all, these microcombs have very large repetition rate. And that's really what sets them apart from conventional fiber uh, femtosecond laser combs. So our mode spacing can be tens of gigahertz. And so one natural thing to do is to match the mode spacing with the ITU grid spacing, which is a multiple of 2.5 gigahertz used in telecom. And so this is some early work we did with Christian Kuz, where we showed that we can use uh, one comb actually to imprint data. So what we're doing here is not, we don't use a sauton as a, as a carrier of information as in the eighties, uh, it was long perceived, but rather we use just a spectral line that constitutes a sauton to transmit data. 
Um, and then we have a second local second comp that functions as a coherent local oscillator for data that we code in both amplitude and phase. And so for the experts, that's called that's called 16 quam um, and, and coherent amplitude modulation. And it's the telecom format that's used for long haul uh, transmission of data. And so we could achieve kind of some decent data rates. They're very, they're not record, but they're kind of record for frequency calls. Uh, so of 34 terabit per second. Another application um, that's particularly uh, beautiful um, um, that was um, really pioneered here by Tobias Herr, who's now in Hamburg, is um, astrophysical spectrometer calibration. And so many of you know that there's a worldwide quest in astronomy to find exoplanets in the habitable zone, so that are air similar. And uh, this is an, an, an daunting kind of precision measurement. And uh, one of the techniques is called the Doppler wobble method, where you look at absorption lines and how they move with time. And um, the prevalent way to calibrate spectrometers done today is with argon thorium lamps, which uh, for environmental reasons, because they're radioactive, will actually be faded out in a few years from, from now. And so all spectrometers have to find other ways to calibrate. And frequency combs are a, a, a superior way of doing this because the lines don't age uh, compared to thorium, thorium lamps. And this is an example of an optical frequency combs uh, superimposed on a shell rating spectrometer, in this case, the espresso one, um, and which is a near R one to two micron spectrograph. And um, uh, the catch, uh, the important part here is that in these spectrographs, the resolution power is finite. It's about 50,000. That means the comb lines have to be apart by 10 gigahertz in order that one can distinguish them on the spectrograph for calibration. And that's really also an application where these microcombs with their widely spaced teeth uh, are really uh, very well suited. And this is work from, from Tobias Herr that showed kind of a proof of concept that this is working. And there's new work underway also that moves that to the visible. Um, another example um, that's been, uh, um, that we've been working on in, in recent um, uh, time, where also I think the microcombs can have a very interesting contribution is coherent LIDAR. And, um, and so for those who are a bit tech savvy and you've, you've, you've watched the news, there's a lot of news these days on, on, on autonomous driving, even companies like Intel developing lasers for this. And uh, one technique that's uh, received a lot, of, a lot of attention in recent, uh, in, in recent months and year is coherent LIDAR. And so coherent LIDAR is a technique where you can not only measure the distance to an object, but get simultaneously also velocity information. And so on every pixel, you have imme immediate um, distance and velocity. And the way this is working is similar to the principles that are used by bats or also dolphins. It uses chirp waveforms. So you have a triangular chirp waveform that you send out and you measure the returned waveform. And from the beating of the outgoing with incoming waveform, you can contain two uh, frequencies, okay, one for the up ramp, one for the down ramp, and the sum and difference of those two give you the velocity of the object and the speed. And that makes this type of LiDAR really unique because most LiDARs today that are based on time of flight only give you distance and you have to take subsequent images, okay, to get the velocity. And this technique here greatly simplifies classification and therefore in particular is useful for long distance. Now, what we've shown is that sautants um, can actually serve as a massively paracoherent LiDAR. And this has to do with the salt and physics. So if you are in this bistable region that I showed before and very quickly chirp the laser, it turns out the salt on, okay, retains, okay, its group velocity, but its underlying carrier changes. And that means that in frequency domain, all the comb lines are chirped simultaneously. And um, so this is a process that we, uh, we've demonstrated and it allows you to make a uh, massively parallel uh, array of, of chirp laser lines with very high precision that you can use for coherent ranging and for coherent LiDAR. And so this, so this is uh, a, a way to increase the, kind of the, the pixel rates um, all the way up to uh, uh, pixel rates that can allow video range, video range imaging of, uh, uh, across long distances. And uh, of course, you can also map the logo of EPFL. And, uh, and, uh, and, but again, there's, there's more applications. Um, again, I won't go into all the detail, but um, I will just say, in addition to spectrometer calibration, telecommunication, LIDAR. There's also uh, neuromorphic computing that has recently uh, um, um, caused a great deal of attention and also the control of sartans using electro-optic and also piezoelectric interactions. Now in the last kind of uh, few minutes, I just want to share with you um, um, the question, okay, all these beautiful applications, but, but, but really what is it that, that determines in the end if something is useful also in applications? And, and uh, in many cases, it's the use case is really determined by power requirements. So in many applications, it's the power that requires if a technology can be integrated. And in particular for optics, the integration of lasers is central. Okay, that's for instance, what's driving right now datacom in, in data centers. 
And so if one looks again, takes a, a broader perspective and, and zooms out, the very reason we can have this conversation today here via Zoom, I'm sitting here in, in, in my home place in, in Lake Geneva, is because of fiber optics, is because KO in the 70s understood how to drive down losses of optical fibers. And fibers are truly remarkable. So they have 0.5 dB per kilometer losses. And, um, and it's really this, this, these years of understanding losses that allowed this uh, optical fibers to get um, um, to this loss level. If you go to integrated photonics, the losses today are dB per centimeter. So it's a five order of magnitude gap between the two. And so, um, um, and when we started working integrated photonics about five years ago, in the entire community, the losses of dB per centimeter was the rule. And what um, I'd like to share with you today is work um, um, that we've been doing at EPFL, but also other groups in the world have, have achieved similar values where we can close that gap to optical fiber, not completely, but we have now made improvement by more than two orders of magnitude. And if you remember the formula I mentioned on parametric oscillations, that reduced the threshold levels from watts of power levels now to few tens of microwatts, uh, which is compatible with, with on-chip lasers. So how does this work? In brief, and I won't say much, it's, uh, it's uh, um, so for the aficionados of micro nanofabrication, um, uh, what we have been developing is a new way to make and manufacture indicator photonics. And the way we do this is we make silicon eye indicator photonics by not etching the material. And so what sounds non-intuitive is, is, is very simple. What we're doing is we're making preforms from glass, okay? So little kind of uh, ridges in which we deposit the material at high temperature, and then we polish the top surface. And that process is called copper damascene process. Uh, it's in every microprocessor. That's actually a cross section of a CPU, a Pentium one, and you see these interconnects here. They're made by copper. And they're using exactly the same process, except that here it's copper that you're depositing, whereas we're depositing silicon nitride. Now that process, which we call the photonic damascene process, uh, emulating again this copper damascene process, um, uh, allows us to achieve, combined with a, re a reform pre um, a a reflow, exceptionally low loss. And so the chip that's behind me, that's the same that you see on the screen here, um, is a one meter spiral, which has a loss of less than one dB per meter. Um, so it's one dB, uh, of, uh, so it's uh, basically one meter pass length in 2.5 by five millimeters. So it shows you the incredibly low loss that we can achieve now uh, in, in integrated photonics. And, and the ultimate limit, actually, we're still far away from, from this material. So we still have about an order of magnitude before we start to see intrinsic material absorption from, from silicon nitride. So what can you do with this? There's many applications. I won't review them all. Um, the silicon nitride really is, is giving rise to not only optical cones, but also to uh, ex extremely narrow line with lasers that can potentially be used for the LISA mission in the future for the, especially space-based gravitational wave interferometers where you need a coherence that is really on the Hertz level or even better. Um, they can use, they can be dealt with functionality such as listen nibate work we're doing with Paul Seidler um, where we make electro-optic interconnects uh, that we put uh, in, in dilution refrigerators to read out superconducting electromechanical devices. So we endow the platform with, with, with further functionality such as the pockets coefficient you can make broadband parametric amplifier potentially, which we're working on uh, and also use them for, for, for supercontinuum. Um, um, so the technology we have actually spun out and here I'm really grateful acknowledging actually uh, QSET. QSET five years ago funded two of my, two of my coworkers to commercialize silicon nitride. Today, silicon nitride is a commercial technology. We have uh, democratized access to the material. Um, so on the upper um, uh, image here is the Ligentech chip that we're shipping out to, to customers and R&D research labs, but even very large telecom companies whose name I'm not allowed to say, but you can probably figure out uh, um, who they are. Um, uh, on the lower part, um, there's something I want to show that we're particularly proud of um, and happy about is that uh, our chips are also fueling kind of the quantum revolution, uh, so to speak. So this is the, in the paper that came out from Xanadu, a Canadian startup. Uh, that has made a photonic quantum processor based on our silicon nitride PICs. And so these devices, they're uh, they're measured in Canada, but they're manufactured in Switzerland. Um, and um, so finally, um, how far are we away from this vision to make truly photonic integrated microcombs? With these low losses now, we can combine the silicon nitride platform with also pump lasers. And we can do so uh, as shown here by simply taking a off the shelf commercial indium phosphide diode, do a hybrid integration and generate optical combs in such an integrated platform. So now you're really closing that gap to that vision I showed earlier uh, um, of making RF to optical link on chip. We're not yet self-referenced, but as I described, there are many applications of high rep rate combs where you don't need to be self, where you don't need to face stabilize. Um, you can also endow the platform with further functionality um, such as piezoelectric tuning for very, very fast frequency actuations, which is also interesting to make microwave to optical frequency converters. 
And uh, the last uh, slide I want to show here is kind of the state of the art integration. This was a project uh, led by John Bowers um, and Kerry Vahala and others uh, NIST, where we made a frequency synthesizer. Uh, um, and uh, this shows one of the building blocks that we've, uh, we, we created, which is a truly chip scale frequency comb operating at 15 gigahertz with integrated in phosphide pump laser, uh, which was turnkey, which all need a battery supply to, to operate and generate 15 gigahertz pulse streams. And, uh, and to show you the last uh, uh, step of, of integration, uh, this is very recent work we did with John Bowers again. Um, and there we combined on-ship indium phosphide lasers with heterogeneous integration directly on the silicon ITAR platform with silicon interposers. And, um, and this is a, a, a two to force experiment and two to force clean room uh, processing. But um, what it really shows is that we can now manufacture these chip scale combs really wafer scale. And, and so for example, on one single kind of uh, uh, four inch wafer, we have more than 3000 uh, uh, chip scale combs operating in tens of gigahertz. And so that really shows you that we can in one wafer, yeah, manufacture more frequency combs than ever operated in, 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 in metrology labs. And so it kind of shows the direction where we're going. Uh, and, and I hope that the technology will really, uh, will really uh, soon uh, um, um, make that transition uh, over the next decade into applications, be they data comm, be they coherent ranging clocks uh, or other applications. Um, and with this, I'd like to um, yeah, um, thank you for your attention and uh, thank the team uh, here uh, for, 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 for all the contributions. And, and a lot of the work is really the, the uh, evident the work of very talented coworkers. I'd like to yeah, thank many of them uh, and I'm also happy to see many of them go on and continue in science. Thank you very much for your attention.